So I'm Mike Waller. I'm the uh, Devon Local Nature Partnership uh, coordinator. Uh, and one of the new initiatives that we've we've started, we launched back at the end of June, uh, was Wild About Devon, which is all about trying to encourage communities and parish and town councils to do more for wildlife, to take action to tackle our ecological emergency. One of the key features of Wild About Devon was setting up a new webinar series. Um, so this is one of just a series of webinars that we've been running since June, uh, running them roughly fortnightly. Uh, over a wide variety of different topics. Uh, but this is the first one that we've had covering non-native invasive species. So very exciting new topic. So tonight is a complete takeover by Exmoor non-native invasive species project team, where we're going to be hearing all about the fantastic pioneering technology and mapping that they've been introducing and test piloting in, uh, in the Exmoor area to tackle some of our most virulent non-native species such as red signal crayfish. So very exciting stuff. Most importantly, we'll also be premiering their new video, which is absolutely fantastic. I can guarantee you're going to enjoy that. So we'll have that towards the end. So that's pretty much it for me. I will hand over to Ali now, who will give you a bit more information about the project and what we can expect to hear about. So over to you, Ali. Many thanks indeed, Mike, and uh, thank you very much indeed for letting us be part of one of your local nature partnership um, webinars. We're very much uh, delighted to be here. I'm Ali Hawkins. I'm the Wildlife Conservation Officer at Exmoor National Park Authority, and I've had the pleasure of being the project manager for um, the Exmoor Non-Native Invasive Species Project. Uh, we also call it Ennis because it's a bit easier to say. Um, as Mike mentioned, um, non-native invasive species are um, something that really concern us uh, a lot on Exmoor. Uh, obviously, it, it's um, one of the five major causes of the decline in nature. And um, we've spent a lot of time working um, to try and control uh, some of the key species on Exmoor. And we're going to tell you more about that this evening. Um, it very much links to work we're also doing at the moment through our new Exmoor uh, uh, nature recovery vision, um, which um, is looking at how we can uh, bring more nature um, to the National Park on Exmoor. So just to give you a, a little bit of the background, um, in 2019, we were lucky enough to receive funding through a water environment grant. So that's been funded through DEFRA and the European Agricultural Fund for Rural Development. Uh, this has been an, a, a fantastic grant which has enabled us to fully fund a project for three years. Uh, that's enabled us to bring together all the invasive species work that we were doing across the, the National Park. So we've been working on some species like uh, knotweed species for many years now, um, goes back about 18 years. So that's a project that's uh, very close to my heart. And this new project, the Ennis project, also enabled us to bring in a couple of new, very innovative um, elements to the project as well, which we'll be hearing about later on. So one of those is uh, looking at controlling uh, signal crayfish, and the other one is looking at an organic approach to um, controlling non-native invasive species. So we'll be hearing more about that from the project team um, later on in this talk. So as you can see from the logos on this slide, most projects are, tend to be a, a partnership of uh, lots of uh, organisations working together. So it's ourselves, the Exmoor National Park Authority, the Environment Agency, National Trust, uh, Natural England and Nikki Green Associates. We're going to be hearing from Nikki later on. Of course, um, our project wouldn't have been possible without the tremendous support from our amazing volunteers. Uh, they've literally given up uh, hundreds of hours to, to help with the project. We've had some amazing, very loyal volunteers who've spent a lot of time um, working on the project with us, and, and that certainly wouldn't have been possible without them. So a, a huge thank you goes to um, our volunteers. So um, that's all from me, uh, just to quickly introduce the project. So um, also here tonight, we have Holly Moser, who is the um, Ennis project officer. We have Pat Watts-Mabbott, who's our volunteer coordinator, 
and we have uh, Nikki Green, who's our crayfish expert that we've been working with. So um, that's all for me for now. So I'm now going to hand over to Holly to um, start telling us more about the, the, the project and the knotweed element of it. Thanks, Holly, over to you. Thank you, Ali, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm Holly Moser, the NS Project Officer. Um, I'm doing a lot of the work in the background, but I've also had the delight of uh, working with the volunteers. Um, I'm just going to give you a, a quick overview of a, a couple of the parts of the project, um, and then I will pass on to Pat. Um, so on Exmoor, um, it's really important um, to, if we're going to control invasive species, that we have a coordinated approach. Um, so we've been working with uh, landowners and local communities, and obviously our volunteers as well, um, to, to map knotweed species um, on Exmoor. Um, and we're currently aware of about 1,200 sites um, historically on Exmoor. Some of these um, have died away through the programme. Um, and others are, are being treated privately um, and some fall on organic sites, which I'll go into in a bit more detail in a minute. Um, but through our programme um, that we're offering to landowners to, to treat knotweed with herbicide, um, we're currently able to treat about 850 of these sites. Um, and we've basically put this out um, to a, a contractor, so a single contractor, um, he carries out all the, all the treatments. We're very lucky uh, that he, he knows all the sites um, really well and uh, we've actually been working with him um, since or the majority of uh, the time since 2005 uh, when we started. Um, so this work involves working with around 200 landowners um, and basically we, we get in touch with them every year to ask permission to go and treat the sites on their land. Um, so there's a lot of, of work involved in terms of setting, um, sending out the, the maps and the consent forms um, and then uh, we also uh, then spend a bit of time following those up and basically uh, we want to get as many um, sites as we can treated um, each year. Um, so the treatments are carried out um, from September to November. Uh, it's just one treatment a year um, when our contractor goes out. And uh, yeah, this year we were delighted that we were able to treat over 95% um, of the, the sites included in the programme. And we get a report at the end of the year um, from our, our contractor and it's um, a, a real delight reading through the port report because um, actually a lot of these sites um, are now um, even not visible and in the monitoring stage so we're having to um, we're basically carry on checking these sites because uh, knotweed unfortunately is a difficult one to get rid of and um, the rhizomes can stay dormant in the ground for a long time. Um, and others, uh, a lot of the other sites are single, uh, sh showing single or few shoots. Um, so yeah, the, it's it's it seemed it seemed quite promising, but there's there's still a lot more work to do. And um, yeah, uh, um, next, yeah, next slide, please. So uh, run very similarly uh, to our um, knotweed program is our skunk cabbage program. Uh, we've recently become aware of this problem uh, on Exmoor. Um, it started with just eight sites that we knew of in 2019 and with the help of our volunteers and, and um, landowners getting in touch, we now know of uh, 27 uh, sites. Skunk cabbage um, is known to be an issue on, on, on Dartmoor and I think in the New Forest as well. Um, it, it, it can be known and you can see in, in, in the left hand corner there that um, it, it, it can shade out a lot of our native flora, um, so it is a worry for us. Um, so yeah, the programmes run very similarly to uh, our Knotweed programme, and uh, we currently know of 27 sites, um, and 18 of these sites uh, we were able to treat this year with herbicide. Um, so this involves one treatment in May, and then a follow-up treatment uh, to catch anything that was um, that is still growing uh, in August and September. Um, we're also able to treat four sites uh, with RootWave, which is our in innovative uh, technology that I'll go into more detail about now. So um, on Exmoor, uh, we do have some sites that we're unable to treat um, on organic land where you can't use um, herbicide uh, to treat, which makes it um, very difficult to treat to treat uh, invasive species. Um, and Basically, uh, the National Park has been involved in a few um, trials over the years, um, working with uh, landowners on organic land. And the most recent is our root wave trials. 
So Root Wave is a really exciting bit of technology. Um, it basically uses electric current, um, about 5,000 volts or up to 5,000 volts um, to treat the plants. And, and essentially what you're doing is um, rubbing an electrode up the, up the base of the plant. Um, and this uh, raises the temperature of the plant, of, of the plant and boils, essentially is boiling the plant cells. Um, it's a really exciting treatment. There's lots of popping, steaming, banging. Unfortunately, I can't show you a video today, but actually you'll see, see it a bit of it in our film later. Um, and through our fun, through this funding, uh, we've actually been able to buy our own, own machines. So we started off um, yeah, working with Ubiquitech manufacturers uh, to carry out single treatments, but through the funding, we've been able to buy our own machine. Um, and, when, and this has basically meant that we can train up local contractors, um, increase the frequency of treatments. And also we started on uh, treating Japanese knotweed, but we're also able to treat uh, Japanese and Himalayan knotweed, skunk cabbage, mombrisha, giant hogweed and fringe cups. So um, there's a few things that you need to consider with root wave. Um, one being uh, it can't be used when it's raining. Um, so you do have to think about the flexibility a bit there, but also we need to consider um, the access um, because it has to be due to its si size and weight. Uh, it has to be transported on the back of a, a four by four. Um, you are then also limited by a 27 meter long cable. Now, in most cases, this wouldn't be an issue because you wouldn't expect to find knotweed uh, in some of the remotest part remotest parts of Exmoor. Um, but obviously, uh, we yeah, because it, it's it's um, spread in our rivers, um, we we do find it in some quite remote places here. Um, and before I go into the results, um, the important thing to say here um, is that we uh, we're still in the very early stages of our trials. Um, in terms of carrying out multiple treatments, it's only been two years. Um, and also because of uh, COVID, we haven't been able to carry out as many treatments as we would have liked. Um, that along with uh, our contractors having a, a, a big backlog of work and also um, linked in with the, the weather as well and, and needing that flexibility has meant that we haven't been able to carry out as many uh, treatments as we would like. So uh, starting with knotweed, um, all of our sites have reacted um, quite differently as you would expect. There's lots of different um, factors in play like substrate and moisture content. Um, but basically what we've been seeing is um, some sites uh, we are starting to see quite uh, stunted growth. So um, it's with this 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 slide and the next slide, um, they've had the same amount of treatment. So um, here you, you can see in the second picture, there's um, some quite stunted growth. And then in the third picture, I just wanted to point out um, and kind of compare this to the next slide. Um, so uh, some of our other sites, and particularly this one, um, which has had the same amount of treatment as the, as the one before and actually is, isn't located um, that far away from the, the last site I showed you, uh, this site is continuing to come back. And as I said before, we haven't been able to carry out as many treatments as we would have liked. Um, but this one, and you can particularly see in that last photo, uh, just two months after the treatments, how many uh, how many shoots are, are coming back up there. So, yeah, we've had a real mix of uh, res well, I shouldn't really say results, promising signs with these. But um, and I just put this one in here to say, uh, so this only received, started receiving treatments uh, last in 2020. Um, and just to say that um, actually here we are seeing um, quite stunted growth again. So I just wanted to kind of point out that difference between the, the 2017 um, treatments and, and the 2020 treatments. So on to skunk cabbage, skunk cabbage is looking a bit more promising. Um, in, our, in the second photo here, um, it's, it had received uh, two treatments. Uh, in 2020 and it only started receiving treatments in 2020 and I just wanted to point out um, just the the number of uh, shoots that we were seeing there so skunk cabbage has got quite a long um, tap root um, and we weren't sure whether the electricity would get all the way down to the roots here um, but basically uh, in this second year um, we've we've actually seen that towards the end of the year there's a lot fewer shoots coming out so this is looking quite promising but obviously the big um, yeah, we'll, we'll have to see what happens next year. And um, at one of our other sites, we saw one one site um, with one plant it, that it's disappeared. And uh, Mombrisha, there hasn't been 
um, as straightforward. Um, unfortunately, due to the the uh, the nature of the plant, it's it's quite a difficult one to treat with root wave. We started off with a bar electrode, um, so it's a, a straight rod electrode, um, and actually we've now um, trialled an arrow shaped electrode. And uh, basically, we've done this because the, due to the nature of the plant, it being a kind of quite a dense clump, um, and you need to get the surface area on it. Um, we wanted to try this new electrode um, because it was seeming quite slow. Um, this is this has been a very tricky one, and actually this is just one of the attempts that we've had. Um, and this uh, that second photo took about um, a, a day to treat. Um, so it's it's uh, yeah, it definitely seems a little bit trickier with uh, with the Mombrisha. Um, like with all of the species, we we're, we're seeing that we need to um, carry out multiple multiple treatments a year and, and um, we really haven't had the chance with this one and I, I think it's more important to say here that we really haven't had the um, we really haven't been able to do as many treatments as we would have liked. I'm now going to pass on to uh, Pat to update on the uh, Himalayan balsam trials. Thank you very much Holly. Um, so yeah I've been I'm, so, 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 I'm, so I'm Patrick I'm the volunteer and outreach officer for the National Park and one of the main parts that the volunteers have been involved in this project is pulling up the Himalayan balsam. Um, it's obviously a really nice volunteer friendly project. It pulls up really easily. If you don't know, it's really shallowly rooted, so you can pull it up pretty easily. Um, it's just a case of finding the plants with those big purple flowers, pulling it up, scrunching it up and leaving it next to the path. Um, the picture you can see in the top right corner there we actually had to leave our trial area. Holly was getting very upset with me. She was giving me um, emails saying we need, we need pictures of volunteers pulling Himalayan balsam. And the problem was by the time we got to sort of the end of this summer when we were sort of asking for those pictures in the trial area, we were going along saying, oh, look, there's one plant after two hours of walking and having two or three volunteers not quite fighting of who was going to whose turn it was to pull it up but it was getting close um, to, to that sort of level um, so we actually we, we spent one week we went further down river to where we hadn't been before and it was really evident that we hadn't been there there's these huge great big swathes of it um, and it was great fun going in there because you know it's really satisfying you can pull up lots and lots of it up um, in the map on the bottom right hand corner, you can see what our trial area is. So that's between Withypool and Tar Steps. And as we're going through there, I mean, when we first started this project, we would have 30 people in one field pulling up Himalayan balsam for two days. Um, at the similar sort of time this year, we had six people walking that entire stretch and finding two bits of Himalayan balsam on that first day. What we were starting to find, though, is that it does keep on coming back. In past years, we've done a great big pull and got rid of everything and then maybe done one more later in the year, perhaps, and just left it at that or we've pulled all the balsam from that site this year. What we've found is that it comes back from seed. So you can go back to the same site every week and pull new Himalayan balsam that wasn't there last week when you pulled it up before. Um, and it's obviously started growing in the last seven, 14 days and we pull it up again and come back the next week and pull it up again. If you don't keep on top of that every you, we could we were doing it every week, we could probably go down to every two or three weeks. If you don't do that as you go through the summer, then those bits start to go to seed and then you've got on well, the seeds stay viable in the seed bank for up to three years. So you've then got that you miss one plant. They they can have up to 800 seeds. So if you miss one plant along that stretch, you've got three years worth of pulling up 800 plants in that area. Um, so it's really important as we're going that we just keep on doing it. So we were running them as almost guided walks. Come and look for wildlife. We were using the iNaturalist app to map as we were pulling it up. This also left us with um, very accessible little GPS dots on a map that we could use that volunteers with iNaturalist on their phone the following week could use as a homing device to go back into where somebody else had pulled them up the previous week.
to find the spots where we know that seed bank is, where we know they're coming back again and again and pull them up, record they pull them up again. If they find a new site along the way with a fresh pair of eyes, then they record that as well. So future volunteers, again, we've got that really nice network of dots along that river that we can navigate our way to now and keep on pulling it up and send volunteers back on a regular basis to do that. Um, so as well as I mean, you can see our big our purple stretch down here where we had been pulling up and doing that Himalayan balsam pulling, but you can also see the dots that we've found across the rest of the National Park. So as well as using iNaturalist to record them along between Withy Pool and Tar Steps, we also had volunteers walking well, both walking predetermined routes, trying to look in as much detail on as much of the river bank on the main rivers as we can for all of our um, sort of target species, all of the invasive species um, that we're getting on Exmoor. Um, we're also just said to our volunteers, look, if you're out and about, if you're walking the dog and you see a stand of Himalayan balsam or some Japanese knotweed or some Mombrisha or whatever it may be, then snap a picture, put it onto iNaturalist. We're using iRecord as well, so both those systems we're sort of we're running in tandem with, um, which worked really well. It's got us a really good data set. Um, we've got I mean, obviously some people who really know what they're looking at um, and are putting their data straight into iRecord. We've also got um, some records of people who have put up pictures of Himalayan balsam saying, I saw this really beautiful purple flower. Can anyone help me identify what it is? It was so lovely. It was covered in bees. I absolutely love it. Um, and we were able to help them identify it as actually that's Himalayan balsam. And actually, you know, I know it does kind of look nice, but it's doing a lot of damage to the riverbank. It's killing off all our native wild flowers and it's leaving us with muddy riverbanks that leads to that mud running into the river and causing sediment into the river, which then gets into salmon reds through the winter and affects salmon spawning and all these sorts of things, um, sort of water quality in the river as well. Using those two bits together has worked really well. And if you say we've got sort of 400 new invasive species records through doing this um, and also lots of other as volunteers have been out there recording, they've been recording other things as well. And we've had all sorts of extra um, records coming in as a result of that as well. Um, now we've spoken a little bit about water quality. Um, I suspect we're going to get into a bit more about that now because I'm about to hand over to Nikki who is going to talk more about these wonderful things, the crayfish in the river. So over to you Nikki. My name is Nikki Green and I am, I guess I have been running the crayfish side of things at the National Park since 2014. Um, I'm a freelance ecologist specialising in crayfish, particularly um, signal crayfish issues. So this species has uh, quite serious impacts. If you look at the photographs, the top one is um, the effects of their burrowing activities on riverbanks so they can cause bank collapse which leads to sedimentation and uh, the bad impacts on salmon spawning grounds and things like invertebrates and the, the general character of the river and things like predation of fish so they will directly predate small fish and fry and lots of invertebrates and things like that as well as the negative impacts on white claw crayfish which we don't have on Exmoor. So we started the River Bile Signal Crayfish project in 2015. Um, the River Bile because it's a site of special scientific interest and because it's one of its notifications is because of um, salmon and trout populations and basically an unspoilt natural upland river. Uh, and of course, the signal crayfish are quite good at spoiling the unspoilt things. Um, so we started with a um, weekly control project, once again using wonderful volunteers. Uh, the aim was for a 
long-term integrated pest management approach to control using three different methods. So uh, the middle left photograph is the uh, sterilization of large dominant males by the removal of appendages called gonopods, which interferes with which they use in, in mating. Um, large males because they tend to dominate reproductive activity and um, they cannibalize a lot of the younger animals as well. So they kind of have a suppressing effect on population growth. Um, and then we use two types of traps, the baited trap, which is the bottom left, which is a sort of a standard funnel trap, which is widely used. And then um, the artificial refuge trap or ART on the bottom right, which is a habitat based attractant. So the crayfish will go into the tubes there because it's a safe place for them to go. Um, I also did a part time PhD based on this work and including lab experiments. So I looked into things like um, both male and female mating behavior and uh, the effectiveness of the sterilization, uh, how, how the gonopod regrowth went as well. OK, so results so far, if you look at the top left hand graph, uh, you see we fluctuated at the beginning, but we've been consistently um, had decreasing catch rates since 2017. Uh, this it's been quite slow, but it's definitely on a downward trend um, since 2017, which is good. We think that perhaps we our trapping density wasn't quite high enough. Um, so lessons are being learned from from the project. Uh, the top right graph that shows that one thing we found out was that the ART traps are much more effective in this type of river system than the baited traps. So you can see the blue, the blue on the, the left hand side shows that we catch a much higher number in ARTs and also a much wider size range of, of animals as well, which is quite important. Uh, we also found that the ARTs catch more or less equal ratios of males and females, whereas um, baited traps are very highly male biased, so they don't catch that many male females. Sorry. Um, the lab experiments, uh, we found out that sterilization doesn't affect uh, the female's choice of mates, so she's equally likely to um, choose a sterilized male to mate with, and the males, um, sterilized males can compete for females just as well as the non-sterilized males. So that's very positive news. Uh, we also found out that the um, sterilized males do produce fewer spermatophores, so these are little pockets of sperm which are used to um, fertilize the eggs. Uh, we didn't find concrete evidence that that actually translates into smaller brood sizes, so fewer eggs. So again, we need more information to, um, to confirm whether that's happening or not. Uh, we also found that the, the gonopods, which the males used to mate with, grow back quite slowly. They take about three years to fully regenerate. And if they're trimmed, which will happen whenever we recapture a previously sterilized male, they will grow. The, that second stage regrowth will um, will be deformed and, and that deformation gets gets worse the more times it's retrimmed. So that's quite good news. OK, so the legacy of the project is basically we've we've done some really good, unique research and um, that information that we have found so far has been disseminated uh, very widely. We've published two papers in scientific journals so far and uh, there are another two papers to come in the next few months now I finish the PhD. Uh, we have turned on 
literally over a hundred volunteers to um, invasive species issues, particularly crayfish issues. Um, there are a few of them in the uh, photographs there, some of our lovely volunteers. Uh, we've had several volunteers who've been with us for the whole project almost. We've had, pro we've had volunteers who have been with us for eight years now and, and that's just fantastic. And they're all very keen to carry on as well to, to see the project to its conclusion. Uh, we've also had lots of public engagement. I've presented at international conferences and we've done lots of local publicity events as well. Um, in the future, what we're planning is we're going to do another two years research just to sort of find out the the things that we haven't quite find out found out yet. We're going to sort of look at tweaking the trapping rates and we're going to investigate the relationship between the sterilization and the brood size a bit more and other things like that. Uh, what we're also hoping to do is to actually apply it as a control method um, in a couple of sites on Exmoor at the at the upstream ex top at the up upstream edge of um, a couple of populations to try and prevent them from expanding further up into the into the sort of the open moorland of the national park where the most important salmon spawning areas are. Okay, so the the other element of my involvement with the Ennis project and crayfish was the um, feasibility studies. So the surveys that we carried out to uh, find out the distribution of signal crayfish elsewhere on Exmoor. So at the mid in the middle of the map, we've got a, a big red line and that is our river bowl population. So we wanted to find out whether that population has expanded since it was first surveyed in 2014. Uh, we also had a, a, a record of signal crayfish from Dulverton, a bit lower down on the River Bowl, which was never confirmed in our 2014 survey. Um, and then slightly north of the River Bowl, there's a little red line, and that is the, the little X at uh, Exford. So we knew that we had signal crayfish there, but we had no idea how far that population extended for. Uh, so we wanted to have a look at that. Um, and then up in the north, we had a sighting for, from the Lynn catchment. So we wanted to look into that. And also we had a report from the river Hadio, which is down in the southeast of the park coming out of Wimbledore Lake. And then we wanted to look at the main River X, which uh, where it comes into the National Park, because we know that there are signal crayfish from Tiverton upwards, but we didn't know how far they had extended into the National Park. So once again, using fantastic volunteers, we, um, we surveyed all these areas um, in 2019, 2020 and 21. And what we have found out is the, the Lynn catchment appears to be free of, of signal crayfish. So we surveyed all of the um, tributaries that we could get to and they were all negative for crayfish. The River Hadio was also negative for crayfish. Um, on the Little X, we found that the population that we knew about at Exford has actually spread quite a long way down the down the river and is almost down to Winsford. So that's that's not very good news. Uh, we also found that the population on the bar that I've been doing my research on has expanded by about 20 percent since 2014. So that spread both upstream and downstream um, to be expected, but again, not very good news. Uh, we also found there are crayfish downstream of Dulverton in the River Bar, but we, we believe that's a separate population. It appears to be quite low density, but we'll try and investigate that a bit more. Uh, we also found that they have extended up the main X into the National Park, but not very far. So, so we found them up um, 
just beyond um, a site called Weir Bridge, which is just a sort of a mile or so into the National Park. Um, and the final question mark is up at Dunster, where we have had another sighting. So we're hoping to um, follow up with that next year and, and investigate that population. So that's about it for crayfish. And I'll hand back over to Ali. That's, that's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Nikki. Um, well, now to the, um, the very exciting part of the evening where we get to reveal our amazing um, new film. So um, first of all, I'd like to say a big thank you to Southwest Water and a special thanks to Kate Hills for uh, funding the making of the film. And um, yeah, we've been very excited that we've been able to make our short eight minute film. Um, we're absolutely delighted to have with us tonight uh, Gemma Gilbert, who uh, made the film for us. Um, Gemma is a, a very talented uh, local wildlife film and documentary maker. She's based down in Cornwall and uh, it's been really wonderful working with you Gemma on the film and um, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to all the hard work you put in to, um, to, to make the wonderful film that, that you did. I've um, we gave Gemma quite a sort of difficult remit of all the things we wanted included in the film and uh, she just took it on and when you see the film you can see that she's really managed to capture the beauty of the, the National Park and some amazing wildlife footage and she's also managed to, to show um, the sort of the impact that invasive non-native species um, can have on a national park or on a, a, an area such as, as, as Exmoor. And the film has also given a, a brilliant insight into the, the work of the project. So um, yeah, thank you Gemma very, very much for all your hard work producing the film. Um, it's been fantastic working with you and I'm going to hand over to you now Gemma to say a few words before we show the film. Thank you. Oh, brilliant. Thanks so much, um, Ali. That was um, what an introduction. Um, so, yeah, as Ali said, I'm, I'm Gemma. I um, run Ebb and Flow Media um, and I work independently to produce documentaries with a focus on conservation and the natural world. Um, I was absolutely delighted to be asked to produce this film. Um, invasive species, I find, are, they're such an important conservation issue, but they're very rarely spoken about outside of the conservation world. So it was really great to be able to raise awareness of invasive species, but also to be able to showcase the incredible work that has been led by the Ennis team. So I spent just over four days filming um, with the team back in June and we travelled around the National Park kind of visiting different areas and speaking to various people who had either had problems with invasive, invasive species or had benefited from the work of the Edis project. Um, I spent time with volunteers on the crayfish project and kind of visited numerous sites um, Yet the main problem, which is similar to what Pat mentioned earlier, was that the team had done such an amazing job at controlling the invasives that it was a real struggle to be able to find any that were kind of well established enough to, to, to film to kind of show kind of what happens when it gets bad. So that was obviously um, a, a good thing and it obviously shows that the project and the methods that they're using are working. Um, I'll kind of let the film do the rest of the talking and I'll be here joining the team afterwards to answer any questions. So here's the film and I hope you enjoy. Towering sea cliffs, tumbling streams, wild windswept moorland and steep wooded valleys revealing spectacular coastal views. Exmoor National Park is a truly beautiful and unique part of Southwest England. A landscape shaped by both people and nature over thousands of years. These rich and diverse habitats are home to an incredible variety of wildlife. The enchanting Exmoor pony, herds of majestic red deer, and even some of the UK's rarest butterflies and bat species all depend upon these pristine ecosystems to thrive. However, these precious habitats give way to a more sinister presence. 
Japanese knotweed, mombrisha, skunk cabbage and signal crayfish are just some of the non-native invasive species threatening our delicate ecosystems across Exmoor and beyond. Spreading and multiplying, these non-native plants and animals leave a long path of destruction that extends far beyond just that of the environment. Our economy, health and the way we live are also paying the price. Costing the British economy an estimated £1.8 billion a year, these species are one of the five major threats to the state of nature. Exmoor National Park Authority has been at the front line of the battle against non-native invasive species since 2005, with its pioneering work controlling Japanese knotweed, and more recently, its groundbreaking trials on the organic control of knotweed and signal crayfish. In 2019, the Exmoor Non-Native Invasive Species Project was launched, and a three-year initiative to coordinate and trial innovative approaches in detecting and controlling the spread of invasive species went underway. An army of local communities, landowners, contractors and volunteers formed to fight for the preservation and restoration of Exmoor's extraordinary landscape and treasured habitats. Lemmus, 25 years ago, which is roughly when we started um, treating knotweed here, everything outside of the water was six foot high, wall to wall knotweed. We're in the situation now where we've got native species back. It's actually quite difficult to find the knotweed. It's a success, but we've still got more work to do to, to try and finish it off. It's the harder part of the process because it's, it's more difficult to find. We can miss it, so the next year it's a little bit taller. We've just got to keep at it. We've taken very much a landscape approach. We've worked with over 300 landowners and homeowners across the National Park to try and get a picture of where the knotweed is across Exmoor. So it doesn't matter if it's on a, a natural watercourse or whether it's in somebody's back garden, we want to know about it and we'll record it and then we will go out and treat all of those sites that we get permission to treat. Treating organically farmed land for knotweed and other invasive species, however, does present its own challenges as it restricts the use of conventional herbicide. The Exmoor Non-Native Invasive Species Project has been trialling a state-of-the-art organic treatment using RootWave technology. We've been using the RootWave machine for the last three years. It works by delivering a high current around about 5,000 volts through the plant, which travels through the root structure and uh, damages the roots on a cellular level and eventually should lead to the destruction of the plant. The good thing about using RootWave is uh, you're not putting chemicals into the environment and obviously where we can produce that, that, that's really good. It's also really great because you basically leave the plant to decompose, which is perfect for invasive species, you don't want to be spreading them accidentally. Not being able to use herbicides can make life very difficult. I'm very lucky because the National Park Authority have done a lot of the actual work. We're, we're very optimistic and especially on this site I think it's been remarkably successful. So it's really hard to say how effective RootWave has been so far, but what we found is it needs several treatments a year. I think to see the results we're going to have to take a more long-term approach. For the best overall outcome across the National Park, the most effective approach is to use a combination of tools to combat these non-native invasive plant species. The RootWave trials are playing an important role in broadening the options available. We've been working on controlling signal crayfish and some of those methods and the results that we'll get from that research will be used nationally and internationally, which was really exciting that we're sort of doing that research here on Exmoor. We're trialling a trap called the Artificial Refuge Trap and we attract equal ratios of males and females and also we catch much smaller crayfish and we're taking out a lot of female crayfish. Male crayfish are quite competitive so they do a lot of predation on the smaller crayfish. We sterilise them by removing four appendages called gonopods which they use in the mating process. Over the last six years, the average size of crayfish that we're catching has actually increased quite a lot. So 
that tells us that we're catching a lot of the smaller animals, the juveniles, which is, which is what we're aiming to do. And it's also indicating that perhaps the sterilisation is having an effect on the reproductive rate of the population. All this vital work is carried out by a team of specially trained volunteers who are an essential part of this important project. We have been learning a lot about how, you know, to get rid of an invasive species and trying to reduce the damage you're doing. That's great, it's lovely. It's nice being out on the river uh, and it's nice meeting people. It's, it's a great place to have on my doorstep to come out and enjoy. And hopefully it will be here for years and years to come and it's through the efforts of the park and other organisations that it's being saved and, and kept for everyone. I think the legacy of the project is a really positive one. We've got some fantastic results, both in terms of on the ground, but also in the different techniques that we're trialling. And so I think that will really help us move forward into the future, particularly looking at some of the organic methods. And also from some of the research of the signal crayfish work has been really interesting and really positive. Some really sort of practical advice that we can distill down into sort of best practice to give to other projects in, in other parts of the country so that they can really benefit from the work that we've done here on Exmoor. So we're really, really grateful that we've had this opportunity and it's really, really been able to allow us to focus very much on invasives and, and make a real difference, you know, working with um, a, a really fantastic team. The benefits of the project are far-reaching and we can already see a vast improvement across the National Park. From the landscape, environment and native wildlife to local communities, landowners, visitors and the economy. If you would like more information about how to get involved with the NS project and to find out how to submit a non-native invasive species record, please visit www.exmoornationalpark.gov.uk or search online for Exmoor Ennis Project. Perfect. Thank you very much, Gemma. That was amazing. Um, let me just put my video up. Um, so yeah, a massive thank you to everyone who's been involved with that. We have now got the opportunity to have a few questions. We've got one question that's been asked so far, so I'll come through and talk a little bit about that. If you've got, if anyone else has got any other questions they would like to ask, then feel free. There's the question and answer thing that should be up on your screen where you can type in your questions um, and we'll do our best to direct them to whoever you want on the panel. Um, so the question is about Himalayan balsam and Himalayan honeysuckle. Um, Himalayan honeysuckle, now I might bring either if Ali or Holly want to come in on this and um, wave at me and I'll pick you up as well, um, but I think Himalayan honeysuckle isn't really part of this project, but it is an invasive species. Um, we have actually found a couple of sites, as although we weren't deliberately looking for it or aiming to deal with it, we have actually come across a couple of sites of it whilst we've been doing this project um, and I guess that may well be the subject of future work. I don't know if anyone else would like to comment any further on that. Um, yep I think you yeah you're right there Pat um, as you say Himalayan honeysuckle hasn't been the focus of this current project although uh, collecting more data on invasive species across the national park has been uh, very useful and Although we've been focusing on the, the key species, the knotweed, Himalayan balsam, skunk cabbage, and also looking at a few locally um, dominant species like fringe cups over on the western side of Exmoor. Um, yeah, I think we're all aware there's, there is a massive list, isn't there, of um, other non-native invasive plant species. So we're really interested in collecting those records and we are aware that Himalayan honeysuckle, um, as Pat says, uh, does occur through the National Park. So um, We'll record that um, keep those records for now. I, I suppose one um, sort of lesson I think that we've learned through working with invasive species is that I suppose it's really important to look at uh, the 
the sort of hierarchy perhaps of damage that they might cause and to perhaps focus your efforts on the the, the particularly damaging ones so i think everybody's very familiar with the damage that that knotweed for example can cause we have um, both himalayan and japanese knotweed here on exmoor and so that's why we've really focused over a number of years to try and get that under control we never use the word eradication because uh, i don't think you can ever say that you can eradicate an invasive non-native species but i really like to say that we've now i feel that we have brought knotweed uh, under control um, as Gemma rightly pointed out, it's very difficult now to actually find large stands of, of knotweed anywhere across the National Park. I remember going back um, many years um, down in, in the Hedden Valley, um, some of you may know, we, we had some uh, amazing photos sent to us on old fashioned slides of the then National Trust warden and he was in his old Massey Ferguson tractor and he was mowing fields of Himalayan knotweed, which shows the extent of it down in that valley at, at that time. And today, for those people who know the Hedden Valley or go and visit, uh, there's one small patch still there that we're, we're treating, um, but otherwise it, it, you know, it's no longer there. And I always feel it's a bit of an unsung hero this uh, in the sort of in terms of controlling uh, invasive species because the result is that you just don't see them um but i often sort of think had we not done any work um towards controlling species like knotweed you know what would the national park look like now you know and and the the neighboring areas as well we're, we're lucky because we're at the top of the catchments so anything that we do on exmoor will have a real benefit downstream as well so um Yes, I, I think that's sort of one lesson I've learned is that you really do have to focus on something and try and do it really well. Um, now, obviously, in this project, we've moved on to other species like skunk cabbage. Um, and uh, yes, skunk cabbage, as Holly pointed out, we've become more aware of, of, of more sites and we'd like to think that we can kind of catch skunk cabbage at a fairly early stage before it gets too um, invasive across the National Park and obviously will cost even more to control. Thanks, Pat. Back to, back to you. Perfect. And um, so we've we've got um, two more questions coming up. Uh, I don't know. I will let you, probably yourself or Holly to answer them. Um, one is: Are there any other invasive non-native species you wish you had included on in the project, or would like to include um, if you had a future project? And they've given an example of giant hogweed, but I guess there could well be others as well. Yep, I'll let, I'll let um, Holly answer that one because she's been involved with um, a bit of giant hogweed. Yeah, so uh, I think Ali um, really covered that just just now. It's um, it's really kind of, and I think what I was saying earlier as well about early detection um, and also uh, the the negative impacts that they're, they're causing. Um, so as part of our our um, feasibility studies looking looking at invasive plants, we have now kind of got an A and, a and B list of, um, of species that we're interested in. Um, and actually just in terms of uh, giant hogweed, that's that again is something that we've kind of recently become aware of um, on Exmoor. Uh, we actually currently know of, uh, only know of one site and I, I didn't go into any detail about it, um, but we, we've we've gone ahead and, and we're trialling uh, root wave on that one site and it happens to be located near to one of our other root wave sites so it'll be really interesting to see how that goes um, but yeah I think it's it's really all to do with um, yeah that, that thing that Ali was saying of um, kind of early detection um, and how much uh, how, uh, how many negative impacts are they're causing. Um, and so one more question, which could be a good opportunity to talk check clean dry, which is how do non-native in space non-native species get here? So I'll, I'll take that one again. Um, so it it is uh, quite a lot of it is to do with um, what what we're doing, what activities we're involved in. Um, so the, the big one is uh, kind of um, activities on waterways. Um, and as uh, Pat has very rightly said there, um, one, one campaign is uh, to do with biosecurity. So how, how can you reduce those negative impacts um, is check clean dry. Um, and we're really trying to put this into all of our work at the moment. Um, again, it's kind of the, the campaign itself is focused on um, waterways. Um, so things like uh, 
boating and, and fishing um but you, you can put it into all aspects of, of what you're doing while you're out exploring Exmoor so um I have in the back of my car I've got a actually a, um or a hoof pick um and a, a brush uh, so I can check my boots check see what's on there um clean them with the uh, the hoop pick it's a very useful tool um and and then it's really important um to to dry it to dry it out so uh with invasive species really important to um particularly with things like fishing equipment to give it a chance to dry out um, and also um it's always uh good to if you can use um a bit of hot hot water as well um and, and leave those for as long as you can before you i guess I just um, chip in there also, Holly, I guess the other way that, um, you know, invasive non-native species have arrived is because um, going back to, you know, the Victorian times, we were, you know, we've always, I think, been great sort of collectors of, of plants. And uh, yeah, we know that, you know, Japanese knotweed was introduced because people thought it was a, you know, lovely thing to put in your garden and something that no one else had. And it's always been very interesting when we've um, mapped Japanese knotweed spread and you can usually track it back upstream to sort of like a, a big country house somewhere that obviously thought it was the latest thing to plant Japanese knotweed in their garden and obviously then it's escaped and spread very successfully down um, the nearest watercourse that it could find but um, but yes yeah, sadly uh, you know quite a lot of these things are planted I mean skunk cabbage I think you could buy that up until quite recently in a garden centre and a lot of people you know plant it next to their ponds because it has an attractive big uh, yellow flower so yes I think um, you know, we've been responsible for bringing a lot of these species, haven't we, across a, a, a sort of number of years. Thanks, Pat. Back to you. Uh, perfect. And we've got one more question here, which is how do you prioritise areas for treatments? And then it says Monbrecia, for instance. Um, and I think Holly and Ali have kind of touched on this a bit, sort of where it's doing the most harm, which is often going to be in the rivers um, with the, I mean, to an extent with the crayfish and definitely with the Himalayan balsam, um, how we target that is basically start at the upstream reach of it and work our way down the river. If you start anywhere else, the seeds, the gorms, whatever they are, are floating their way down on to you. I don't know if either of you want to add any more to that. No, I, th I think you've probably summarised it really well there, Pat. Um, like you say, um, our approach has always been sort of, well, talking particularly about the not weed control work, which has obviously been going on for a, a long time. We've realised that, you know, you have to take a landscape approach to controlling it, which is why we've uh, gathered records from you know, very natural sites such as uh, the River Baal or other river systems, but we've also um, you know, gathered records from people's gardens or um, some fly tipping on the edge of a, a roadside. And we've made sure that all of those sites form part, part of the treatment programme because you, you have to treat all of the sites that you know about to, to really get on top of it. Um, so I, I think that's, um, as Pat says, you have to keep keep going upstream until you find the the, the top um, site on your catchment and look at look at a landscape approach really and you have to keep going you have to keep going back um, with as Holly said we've been very lucky to work with the same contractor now for many years and that's been amazing because he knows the sites very very well um, and he goes back out to either treat or as Holly said you know a lot of cases he's now just monitoring the fact that uh, that you know there's nothing to be seen or very very tiny shoots so um, but it is important to, to sort of keep going with all, with all of that work thanks Pat perfect and um, I think we'll have this just last question and I think we may have lost Nikki who may have been best placed to answer it um, but we've got the question why not just cull the crayfish which I guess I'm, is not a reference of why don't you just take them all out um, because we have been taking thousands and thousands of them out, but it's probably more of reference to why are we bothering with the um, sterilisation of them. Um, to my understanding, that is I'm um, basically crayfish are cannibalistic in their behaviour. So when you um, sterilise the large males, 
you, they dominate the mating behaviour, so any females which are left end up with sterile eggs and also those large males are uh, hopefully eating some of the younger ones which we may not be able to catch because they're too small to get into the traps um, and so those larger male crayfish are probably attacking and eating those younger crayfish and so they start to sort of destroy their own population um, from within. Um, I don't think, Nikki, if you are here, if you want to speak up and add anything to that. Um, otherwise, we will, sorry, one more question. What limits the amount of clearances that you can do? Money, volunteers, weather, access, what limits the amount of clearances that you can do? Is it money, volunteers, weather or access? Um, I guess that that is um, a about where in all of them it is it's a mixture of volunteers and money um, and even volunteers need a certain amount of money for coordination and paying expenses and getting people out to the site um, but yeah all of those things um, that you've mentioned Sally um, influence it um, just sheer number of hours in the day I mean we were thinking we could e extend the Himalayan balsam pulling further down river, um, trying to see everywhere every week um, over, I mean, essentially to do this completely, we want to go all the way out to Exmouth. Um, that is, uh, you know, we've got 30, 40, 50 miles or something of river to work our way down and try and see every metre of it every week. And apologies, we've got more questions coming in. Um, Andreas, I work in Sweden. We have big problems with Japanese knotweed. We're looking for a good method to treat it. And the root wave seems to be the root wave seems to be very interesting. Do you think it's the best treatment we can find today? Holly, you're probably better to answer that one. So is the root wave the best way to treat um, Japanese knotweed? And after this, we'll hand over to Mike to do a bit of summing up and close the meeting if that's OK. Yeah, so um, I think with this one, um, yeah, with with Japanese knotweed and, and particularly for us on organic sites, um, there aren't that many different options. Um, and yeah, root wave, I mean, when we when we decided to go ahead with it, it, it seems really positive and, and we're definitely seeing some promising signs. I mean, um, yeah, it's, it's really too early for us to say in terms of how successful it's been here on Exmoor. Um, but from what I've what I'm hearing um, from lots of different projects and it's, it's definitely becoming um, more widely used um, it, it, they're saying that potentially um, I think three to five uh, treatments a year is looking the way forward. Um, but like with any any uh, invasive species, it, it does take a long time. Um, but yes, the answer to that, I, I mean, it, it seems promising from what, what we've seen so far. Brilliant. And Mike, would you like to do the final bit of summing up? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm a little bit terrified of root wave, I have to say. It looks uh, it looks brilliant, but it also looks a bit scary. So um, I'll, but no, I'll, I think it's a very well behaved now. <laughs> <laughs> I think no, I think it's, it's very encouraging to know that there are these new technologies and new methods being uh, created. Um, to tackle in you know non-native invasives because there is that sense that you know there's ever more coming in and how do we tackle it so to sort of see action on the ground and working so effectively I think is encouraging and I think also it, it's brilliant uh, you know to um, the the local nature partnership this is what it's all about really uh, being able to share this information and hopefully we can sort of roll some of this learning and information out across Devon and also nationally as well so we can start to, to tackle the problem more effectively across the country because of course it isn't just in Exmoor or Devon we know we've got this problem everywhere so that's brilliant thank you so much to all our speakers this evening um it was it was really enlightening for, for me and I hope everyone else would agree it particularly uh I'll say thanks to Gemma for that fantastic film uh obviously had a technical problem at the beginning but no problem it was I think that was absolutely brilliant um so just finally, if you uh, wanted to uh, follow the, the NS project, then obviously it was, it was mentioned at the end of the video there, just log on to the, the Exmoor National Park website and you can find out what's going on. But you can also follow them on Twitter 
and on Facebook as well. And that's the same for the Devon Local Nature Partnership as well. Please do follow us on, on Twitter and on Facebook and you can keep up to date with the forthcoming webinars. I don't know if we've actually got any booked at the moment because obviously we're coming to the end of the year, but we will get some new uh, webinars booked up for, for next year. So do keep tabs on that and as, as always have a look on the website as well. So I think that's pretty much it for me um, and we'll hopefully see you next time for the, for the next webinar. But until then, uh, thank you very much for tuning in and have a lovely evening. Good night. <laughs>